Um, all right, so I'm sure a lot of you have already read this book, but I've been listening to the over story. Does anyone know that? Holy guacamole, right? Amazing <laughs> book. <laughs> yeah, and it, it's not like there's a lot of, you haven't thought of, but then it like makes it more real. And there's nothing like a story to deliver truth, right? I mean, instead of like it just being the, you know, if you don't know what it's about, it's basically about trees and protecting redwoods, right? In, mm -hmm. you know, the movement of protecting redwoods. <clears throat> and there's all these different things that it's making me think about that I had thought the thoughts before and they're, they're just different in the context of the story, or maybe it's a time of my life, maybe, I don't know, right? But it's interesting because one of the reasons why I love yoga, and one of the things that yoga taught me is to be open to certain truths continually to unfold themselves in my awareness. You know, so lines I, you know, a yogic realization I would have heard 30 years ago still gets new life this year. You know what I mean? I've had a couple of those and that there's a constant um, peeling and unfolding of truth that's really, um, that, that somehow yoga gave me a more concrete template for, but also patience for. You know, so when, when um, Rilke writes the line, um, we need to live into the questions, that for me has completely different meaning now in the last few years than it did where I thought I was hearing it 20 years ago, <laughs> right? right? Like I get what's being meant there more and more and over stories like doing some of that. Um, and it's not like we don't know we're destroying things too fast, right? Right. I mean, unfortunately, you could try to deny that, right? Um, but we are, and, and 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 trees are kind of a symbol of that because they're without them we don't live, right? Literally, we have no atmosphere. All of our genetic history comes through trees. <laughs> it's just like one of those simple truths. But but the thing that get, you know, one of the reasons why mind body solutions. I formed it was this belief about consciousness that there are certain truths that need to be processed. Someone needs to mute themselves um, in the back. There you go. Um, certain, certain um, like truths, existential truths that our minds are inadequate to absorb alone. Right? Like, and when mind is left alone to deal with the world, I hope you agree with me on some level, we're way more fragile when mind tries to make sense of the world and try to control it, right? Um, and so a lot of what, from a consciousness point of view, why mind-body solutions came into existence was how do, you, how do you process things that don't have answers to them, that don't tell you exactly what to do, and yet are true nonetheless, right? And though there are a whole bunch of truths like that that a humankind has to figure out or like not answer yet, but at least let in. And so one of the things that, that there are a whole bunch of cool things I'm getting out of Overstory right now, but one of them is, and part of me resists a little bit because I think it's really easy to when you see it, I mean, it's been utter carnage what we've done to wood and trees over our, and we need them and they're, you know, trees are giving and they are nonviolent and they basically are amazing entities, right? That literally take, think about it, they take light, um, CO2 and, and water and grow and, and let out an immense amount of carbon in their limbs and their tree trunks and stuff, right? They actually put it into form that's contained and they keep giving to their surroundings, right? So they're amazing entities for sure. And 
I've grown up my whole life. My mom's an artist and has painted trees since I was little. Like I've been fascinated by trees my entire life. I live on a wooded lot. I've let it all fall naturally. I'm not doing the things you're supposed to do to clean up your yard. You know, like I let the trees just come down. I milled them up when I, when we built this house, I milled them up and put them into my, um, instead of letting the trees just waste, I milled them up and they're inside my house. You know, they're, they're like part of the, you know, all this stuff. So I've out, but then there's all of a sudden another level hits and, and, and deeper. And um, the thing about the kind of, this kind of truth is that, and, 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 and it's a natural human reaction is when you see and appreciate the beauty of something right away, you process it through um, justice or guilt or dread, right? So your mind actually, in, in my opinion, in the face of this amazing truth. So this, the book ends up being about people trying to protect the redwoods and going to a lot of, you know, tree sitters, all that stuff, right? But, but it's like, there's a tendency in the face of truth to convert it immediately to moral truth, right? And then try to figure out what to do with it, okay? And as soon as a group of people translate truth to moral truth, you're gonna get resistance from everyone else, right? This is one of those features, although it's maybe the only way we get to organize, but one of the things that, and so part of me, if, if it just becomes a justice issue, right the way we're savaging the rainforest for example right now right irrationally unself-interested right like it's our self-interest too it's not just the beauty of the tree and they're holders of time right they move at a different rate than we do right and they actually are profoundly giving and they don't take out of the earth so one of the experiments in the, in the giving tree or in, not the giving tree, that's an old book from childhood. If you don't know that book, you should know the giving tree, right? But is that like, there's an experiment where they plant a seed, a couple of the characters plant a seed and then they weigh it they, in 200 pounds of soil. And then they weigh it eight years later. And the, the same amount of soil is exactly the same except minus one ounce. And the trunk weighs over a hundred pounds, right? So like literally how does an, how does a tree convert oxygen, water, and air, and CO2 into mass, right? It's kind of like, we only take mass off of the earth, right? We take the mass, we consume it, and we grow our bodies, but the amount of, of the relationship between the mass we create from what we take from the earth and what we put back into the earth is deeply disproportionate, right? Where a tree doesn't do that right? It somehow creates mass out of energy without stealing, right? So getting, I mean, can I hear some of the yamas sitting right there, right? What non-stealing would actually be. But, but so, so right away, of course, the story goes to the justice part of it. And I get that. But sometimes I worry that if certain shifts of consciousness have to become contagious, that one of the poison pills of consciousness is morality, right? That it stops too many minds too fast because they get threatened, because they're made to feel like they miss something, right? And so one of the things that, that I think that I want to take out of overstory this time is part of why I started Mind Body Solutions, which was because I want to sit with the truth before I react to it. I want to appreciate what's actually true. And as I appreciate the beauty of trees, of course it makes me weep because of the carnage, because of the history, right? Of what we've done and how we haven't realized how symbiotic we are with plants, right? We actually think the world's here for our dominion, probably not, right? I'm like, that's just not true. So one of the things that I think is so powerfully important about centering and about a yoga practice is that if I can get to where in my consciousness, where I'm more connected to what surrounds me without judgment, the faith of mind body solutions is that that will be transformative. 
that's why I spent the last 21 years, 22 years doing this, is that the sheer, and I don't mean present or mindfulness. I mean, literally before your mind, we are connected, right? Before you have thoughts, that's the existentially shared level. It's not just that's all suffering. That's one of the great teachers obviously said that what we share universally is suffering. True, right? But there's experience at the very core. And that's the level that the centering part before your yoga practice, before action, remember asana is only one limb, but there's an apprehension of, of connection and reality that the yogis are trying to pass down that precede your moral judgment. That is where the world is actually unified and not fought for, right? That's the level that you're practicing every time you set it. What's revealed before our minds encounter? That's why potentially saying, hey, calm the mind down. Don't just control it. Calm it, that's my words, calm it down so more is revealed. So sit up straight and tall. <clears throat> allow. So one of the ways that I try to say that, I tell you like all oh, yoga poses begin and end in relief and, you know, all these things. But when I'm centering and literally trying to practice a dimension of my consciousness that's more unified with what surrounds me and actually can take in beauty a little bit more purely, right? When I sit and be part of what's around me and take very seriously, this is what I hope you're doing in centering, that you have a relationship between you and what directly surrounds you. And you get to choose what your fundamental relationship is to here. So as I allow my base and feel the grounding and locate myself in the room and let my mind quiet and be informed by my presence in the entirety of the room, right? I always say it real practically, like what's above you, what's below you, each side of you, what's in front of you and what's behind you. The part that's imperceivable, but it can be felt. And as I start to open to that, maybe you've done enough asana where it makes you start trying to think about or practicing balancing your head over your neck. Right, and as you balance your head over your neck, maybe you start to feel the, the quiet expanse in the room with you. And then at this level, somehow, trees are all interconnected. Like they're touching underground. They're communicating underground. They're communicating overground, right? In this place, where I just purely receive. So my mind wants to block, it wants to judge. In this place, this is the beginning of asana. It's also the source of shavasana, of relief. Don't just think about yoga in terms of your mind. Good God, what a miss if you do that. So can I make my effort, my action congruent with what surrounds me and runs through me? Bring your hands into prayer if you can and stay on balance. I cannot, I want the balance. I'm gonna start the effort, hitting down a little bit more with my sitting bones, experiencing the rise of my chest, following it, broadening across the collarbones, but also between the shoulder blades on the back body. 
as I do that, rotating the inner head of the femur bone in and out and connecting right back to the feet. Lifting the chest, but opening the side armpit chest horizontally, like a shuttered window letting in light. Turn it into a grill, a receiving grill. As you do that, you'll have to engage more, but you get to receive more purely. Soften your jaw, the temples, the inside of your mouth. As you do that, don't lose the ground. Let go of your day. Prepare your mind to do yoga. course, my mind struggles in the truth of the immensity. So repose, re-go through the stability provided by your body. Fill the vessel. Honor the vessel. Honor all that's around you by staying steady inside of your own space. Merge it. Stay steady. Do both. Good, and then release. So we're gonna do the bond again with the sternum lifts and the chin drops. But think about this as um, disciplined receiving. So lift the sternum up, drop the chin, creating slightly more structure. So the energy in the space here is slightly more directed through your body. It's a Kalba Banda. re in your jaw, the inside of your mouth. We're surrounded by everything. Raise your head up with closed eyes. Open your eyes. All right. One of the... One of the <laughs> Remember, I'm having my brain light on fire. When I get lit on fire by something, I get my I process in all levels, right? So I've also been thinking about because I told you a couple of weeks ago I I listened to 1984 by George Orwell, and one of the foundational thoughts of thought control, or what he's trying to lay out as makes us more of a thought control, is the sense of isolation, disconnection from the forest, our human forest, but also from the natural world forest, right? And so it's a very sterile environment in 84, in 1984, because they don't want you connected, right? So again, sit up straight and tall, feel your skin, try to sense wherever you can that the air is touching your skin everywhere. Because remember, because Angar will say, intelligence enters the poses through the skin. And then do another level of internal. As I lift my chest, I want, I want you to feel the inner circumference of your rib cage, not just the lift on the outside, the inner circumference of, of the rib cage. And so you're actually sitting in more alertness, in more action, but you're trying to honor the vessel as it plays through you. Right? So you're just sitting balance your head over your neck and trying to think that maybe the empty space in you can also align your poses, right? That you don't have to assert everything. What level of being can grasp the depth of trees? It's going to take some work.
how can all living things actually support my yoga practice? Not just as an idea, but as an energy. Good, and then release. Remember that your mental energy is less organic than your body energy, right? So let's start to move it around a little bit. So we're starting to do what we always do, right? But we're thinking about creating the freedom and the space in order to receive here more, right? So you're just trying to, and I, you know, as you know, I've been emphasizing for months now how important the space is in certain parts of your spine, right? right? One of them, especially for those of us that sit a lot, is in the low back, right above the sitting bones, the separation between my torso and my legs, right? So I'm going to lift up and put myself in traction again because I'm trying to create that space, right? And then I let gravity come back. And then I lift up again. I want to create a sense of lightness here because it's the lightness in me that integrates with the space outside of me, not my control and effort, not what my mind initiates, right? So it's an experience. Connection is an experience. It's not a willful action, right? All right, and then, so you're getting lighter now. Right, that's what you're going for that sensation. And now I want you to elongate your back, right? So lean forward or put you know and try to actually make it more full of effort now. Oh my gosh, there's a literally right outside my window, there's a bird about mm, 12 inches from my face right now, just so you know. Looking right in at me, looking for food, I think. Right? <clears throat> All right. So now I'm gonna add some discipline to it. So I'm forward, I'm lengthening, I'm hitting down through my sitting bones. So Opposite directions are going to be, I just scared it with my hand. Opposite directions are going to be what, um, what creates yogic realization. So I'm going to hit down through my sitting bones and lift up through my chest. And I'm also then going to broaden between the shoulder blades. And then I'm going to broaden across the lower sacrum, right? Across my very low back. In that space of elongation, which I know is part of the realization of yoga, right? I'm going to keep that open, feel my inner groin, extend through my inner knee, down through my inner heel. I'm gonna make sure I'm consistent with all of what's happening, right? And I'm gonna breathe here for a while. It may seem like I'm not working right now. I don't know if you can tell my voices I'm having trouble because I'm really working and I'm talking, which is usually a mistake, right? In yoga poses. So I'm just gonna hang out here for a while feeling the space and now using the space to oh my rib cage is revolved oh i've got more weight on one sitting bone than the other so make the micro adjustments you need to make in order to become more full and more empty and then empty and more full now balance your head over your neck and as you do this work internally start to try to feel the whole room but don't let up on the clarity of what your body's presenting and take a couple of breaths, for God's sakes. What an amazing bunch of movement that can be congruent with everything. My breath doesn't have to steal anything. Good, and then release. Now, instead of just collapsing right back, I wanna stay elongated, right? So now, hopefully after that stretch of your back, right? Like you're able to lengthen your spine. Space in your spine will be transcendent energy, right? It's just freaking true. It's one of the things being passed down by asana. So you're, you're like getting that, you're getting taller. And now after I'm feeling that elongation with some effort, I'm straightening my head and I'm, I'm letting it adjust me, right? I'm letting the fact that I'm connected to everything actually bring me into better balance without it just being a thought, right? Thoughts are so, they mean nothing without the body. They can't make it to the world. That's why I study asana, right? I'm constantly wanting to see if I can be more nonviolent in relationship to what surrounds me. How do I become a partner in what surrounds me and then release? 
So one of the things that I've emphasized last time I taught was, was trying to make sure that there, the space between your legs and torso becomes more um, activated. So you know, hopefully you're in a chair, right? I want you to lean back some and just try to push out on your femur bones, right? Like that. <clears throat> And then back again. So I'm doing a back bend, but mostly I'm not worried about this part of the back bend. I'm trying to create awareness for my mind that's already happening in my body, right? And it's coming to my brain, but for my mind, I'm using my hands and movement to reveal a really important space, which is the space between my femur bones and my lower abdomen and then release. Then I'm gonna come forward and cover it up. Forward bends cover it up, right? The key to a more advancing forward bend is to come forward without covering up that crease. It's one of the keys to a forward bend, right? And then go back again, I'm gonna open it, right? I'm gonna open it and lift, pulling on my legs, lifting my chest back but I'm trying to open the space at the crease and then come back through and watch that gravity come down to my inner heels again, right through my legs. And then I'm gonna open it again. There's a lot to take in here. Right? And then release. And so now I'm gonna to try to keep that. And if you can, like Michael, I know you can't do this, but I want you to take your fist behind you and push forward on your own sacrum, right? So I'm gonna push myself forward there, right? And open my chest. So I'm getting input lower on my body, connecting it so the sacrum reflects the sternum, okay? And the sternum less so reflects the sacrum, right? It turns out that the earth shows us more than the sky shows us about the earth, okay? So, so I'm pushing forward and I'm lifting up and I'm holding here for a second because I want there to be more connection and then release. And of course, because I've got this arm back, right? I'm off balance. I better do it with the other arm. And guess what? This isn't going to be as fun. So I'm going to go the other hand behind me, right? Push in on my own sacrum, open my own back. So I've got this reference hitting into my sacrum and opening my chest and then release. First side again. Now I'm gonna pay more attention to staying open here, putting my other hand on my femur bone, pushing in and making this even more active through my pelvis, right? Because that's one of the dulling influences of sitting all the time. You lose the movement of energy through the pelvis from the spine to the legs, and then release and go the other way. This is why, probably why sitting is the new smoking, right? Right, so I'm gonna go and get pushing and open. So I'm trying to connect, right? And open, opening my chest too. Good, and then release. So. One of the things when I grab my chair behind me to physically try to aid in the lift in my chest, right? <clears throat> Which is, there isn't, there is no action in asana that's for free. There's always good and bad that come from every action, right? So I'm gonna go and get my hands behind me, right? Using my chair. I'm gonna lift open my chest but can I maintain the space and the length between my sitting bones and my spine? As I'm back this way and elongating, can I stay open in this amount of effort? I'm working it right now. As I'm talking, I hope you are too. Good, and then release. Now I'm gonna take my hands 
on the front of my knees. We're gonna go back and forth a few times because we're trying to boost burst energy through our spines, right, and into the world. So I take my hands on my femur bone, right? I'm gonna hit and get my activating vest, right? If I come forward, I'm in upward facing dog. If I stay back, I have to try to ground my legs. Here, when I come up and come forward, my legs stay grounded because of gravity right, because of weight distribution. And then come back here, when I hit back on my own femur bones and lift my chest, I have a more of a job to hit down and keep the elongation. I'm saying to get a separate your lower abdomen from your femur bone, bones, right, your thigh bones. Take a breath or two. Good, and then release. So now you're gonna go off to the side. So right away, so, um, as you know, this is kind of a funny thing, and it's part of why I'm teaching this class right now. So, I've got a torn rotator cuff, and I'm having some nerve impingement, stuff's going on in my arms, and so I'm contemplating getting a wheelchair that has some power assist wheels. So, I went and tried a power assist wheels for when I'm wheeling greater distances, and it was really intense, weird technology. But for, the, for about four or five hours over the rest of the day, I felt like someone was surging energy into my spine, right? Like, cause it would start up and I'd get this kind of like thrust forward without having to grip down and do it. I got to receive an upward forward momentum through my spine and the imprint stayed with me, right? And so in this part of the class, what I'm trying to do is have you experience a surge through your spine to see if your yoga practice allows you to maintain it throughout your day, right? So again, so, because it was really cool, actually. It was a little bit freaky, to be honest with you. It felt like I was still was having a cyst on the wheels, right? And so, so here, I'm trying to get the separation, create the space. So I'm coming forward and lifting up, hitting down, right? And so now I'm going to take, go back and take one arm back. But instead of just getting all the attention here, right? I want to feel that space between my femur bones and my abdomen. And then as I get that space, is there an opportunity to hit down through your heel, down your heels, and then release? So I like to say, I see Amanda going like this. You don't even have to take down over your head. So that's exactly right. Good adaptation, right? All right, so then you go up and you're going back and you're opening, but you're trying to stay in your legs, right? Because gravity is gonna throw your mind away from your legs. Good, and then release. And then inhale and take your end up and then exhale around it. So here, right? Feel that fist you put into your own sacrum. So feel the sense of direction before you start to lift your chest. Feel that surge pop as you start to come into the twists, right? So something's traveling through you. You're using your memory to feel a sense of direction. Good, and then come on back to center. Feel the center. One of the things that I've been thinking about because of older stories, how funny we must look to trees because we move so much faster than them. Like over time, they may not even recognize us because they're going at a different speed, right? A big different speed. Inhale, take that one. Again, I'm trying to get all of me in this action, not just take my arm up over my head and then exhale and bring it across. Find a way to open. So before I start to crank open, I wanna surge through my spine. In order to surge up, I have to go down. Trees have to have a root system, right? Hit down and then lift under the collarbones, revolve, where your mind gets to feel more control Right, but you're making sure you're following the root system down as you go up. Good, and then 
come on back to center there. So I have this kind of um, bizarre yoga peer. I mentioned him before, Richard Freeman. He's like kind of a crazy yogi from a stronger yoga practitioner from Colorado. He's been doing yoga. I've been doing yoga a long time. He's been doing it at least 20 years longer than me. Okay. And he's read more ancient texts and been more out there than I am. Um, and he said to me, we're talking about the earth and how you bring earth into poses. And because <clears throat> he's the only guy I know in the world I could talk smack like that. Like, how do you bring earth into your poses? Like, like and he doesn't even bat an eye. He just like, that's a normal question, right? And he said in the ancients in one of the texts he read, the ancients think that something needed to drop down towards the earth in order to take in the earth, right? So, and the, the, the place we were talking about was the base of the band because I'm always talking to him about bondas. And he was talking about the line from the yogis were something like, let do drop from the base of your spine towards the earth. Right, so can I think about it as morning and fresh and a whole bunch, because I wonder why he said do, I'm not exactly sure, right? But I'm living into that. What, need, what needs to drop in order for me to rise? And he's adding another layer to me and says, without something dropping, the ancient are saying that you can't let the earth into your pose. Somehow we haven't been able to let the earth into our minds. One of the symptoms is we don't see trees. We don't get what they are, right? And with, there's some work to do before it's a moral issue about whether we chop down trees, right? And so as I sit up straight and tall here for a second, I'm gonna allow the centering Shavasana part of the practice to drop me as I rise and remember, there's network of roots have to go down. Even trees have to follow this. It has to go down in order to go up and utilize the earth, right? So you're sitting here thinking, oh, I'm just doing Tadasana. Uh, incorrect. You're practicing whether you can let the earth into your pose. And in order to do it, you have to do something opposite. You have to surrender down, right? So I'm just going to balance my head over my neck and stop my job because I'm thinking there's a part of me I don't get to control that needs to go down in every pose in order for me to recognize the role the earth plays in everything that I am. So I'm going to take, try to let whatever that means to let that in. And then I'm going to try to apply it to freaking asana. Right? I'm going to try to actually integrate into action. Good, and then release. So now with gravity changes, right? It's gonna get harder to do. How do you drop something towards the earth when you're off balance? Instead of just dropping this way, which would be calamitous, right? I would just go right out of my chair and violence waits for me over there, right? So that's not how I wanna drop towards the earth, right? So I'm leaning over and I'm trying to figure out how to expand my chest and open right, knowing that, of course, I have to push down through my sitting bones, my feet, that's the asana part. But what the hell it means, what the ancients meant by do, obviously, it's more subtle than anything I've been doing, right? So that's my initial start. So I'm sitting there going, okay, I'm leaning over, I'm rising my chest, I'm doing the water sucking action. It burns water fast if you overwork too hard. And then what part of me do I need to access to surrender down? And what's interesting about the word for me to do, right, is that it's, it's water, right? It's not just air. And then I'm going to go up, balance my head, try to form around the action, the subtle dropping, the expansion. And then I'm going to let that, I can already tell you to rotate my shoulder, right? Open up my shoulder in order to find my elbow pit in my palm. 
And then I'm trying to feel this in relationship. I'm leaning over to my, I'm gonna say my right. So now I have to feel where my left is. I'm leaning to my, yeah, where my left is. And I'm lengthening my spine. Wow, my gain in neuropathy in my heart. Tingling like crazy. Good, and then release. So I need to shake that out. So that length in my, so my oh, thoracic plexus, right? Started to tingle up because it's not used to receiving, receiving space. Right, so I'm gonna say, take that in, right? And then I'm gonna go the other way. So remember, I'm looking for other layers of my pose, right? That's implicit in asana. Right, so now I just sit here for a second and make sure I got the, the grounding with me. So now I take the arm up into action. I'm going to elongate my spine with effort. Remember, it's fine if you're here. It's even fine if you're here, right? But as I, I got to find a dropping part that's more, I got to get this more balanced, right? And then from that dropping, open not just my effort but from the earth to the sky right but to bring the earth with me the giants before me are telling me something subtle has to drop and they're giants good and then come on back to center that's what i was trying to get across in those reflections from kiss my asana and then go back and forth was that, that be grateful that someone's been here before you, right? And they've tried to like give you breadcrumbs. So I'm doing a little back bend here, coming forward, right? Forward. Now I'm going to try to plant. So, so um, if you think about how you add earth to poses, um, just one second here. Okay, if you think about how you add earth to poses, right? You, it's a form of grounding, right? So, so I'm sitting here trying, and I'm gonna get in, I'm gonna follow, I'm moving back and forth because I wanna find the place where I engage, right? So I'm trying to find it in relationship to more than just my mind, right? And then I'm gonna engage. When you try to bring earth into your pose, right? You're gonna to have to open and you're gonna to have to drop. That's what they're saying to me. And it's a part of me. I don't know about your will, but my will is generally less organic than my relief, right? So I know that in order for me to drop something, I'm gonna to have to access something else. And I don't just wanna drop my dry thoughts. Right, I wanna drop something else. Good, and then release. Inhale again, take your arm up, exhale. Make this all fluid. Because when you add rhythm, it's gonna be not so disturbing, right? Rhythm is a great sinker of integration, right? Um, it, it synchronizes stuff, inhale up. Exhale over, make everything part of the movement. Surge through the spine, turn the head. Good, and then come on back to center. So typically, like so, if without thinking too much, just turn your head to the left or to the right. And then, you know, like you do all day long, right? That'd be like the wind blowing the plant above the ground, right? Right, so. But if you try to anchor it in your chest, so so like there's the root system that has to go down, right? And so once I anchor the center of my chest, keep that dropping towards the earth. 
and then turn my head from here, right? There's a big change. Now the big question is when I use that much focus, can I make it fun, right? Because otherwise it's just kind of sucks. We're gonna go the same direction. And so, oh my God, you know, part of the fun of it is making it be rhythmic, right? So I'm going back and forth and I'm actually touching the center of my sternum, right? So I don't, so I stay present there. And I'm just going back and forth like, hey, this gets more graceful if it's on rhythm. Good, and then come on back to center. I'm gonna do it the other way in a second, right? But I'm gonna like, so here, here's just turning my head, right? That'd be like the wind blowing the plant above the ground, right? And so now I'm gonna make sure I know where the center of my chest is. So something stays connected to the earth, something drops. Then I'm gonna turn my head, leading from the center of my chest. So I have more strain this way. And then come on back to center. So I'm gonna try to loosen up the strain, keeping the earth here, but using rhythm to do it, right? The other thing about trees, and then come on back to center, is that although they don't, move a lot, like in terms of across the earth, right? They actually are always in constant movement, right? So I'm just trying to find rhythm here as a way to make it more fluid. Good, and then release, so Often I've been trying for years to figure out the genius of more of a flow practice, right? So we're gonna kind of do a series of things, trying to put them all together. Go back, come forward, rise up from the earth, up because something drops. Ground down, I'm pushing my feet above me to go back, to open, to be slightly more long, come forward, right? This time, inhale, come up, exhale, around, surge through your spine, like the fist in your sacrum and revolve, fluidly uncoil, come back to center, let there be a dropping as you take the arm up. Here comes the fall, grounding the air, pivoting, surging through my spine before I activate my wings, right? And then opening through my and then back, go back, come forward, ground and lift, come back, inhale, exhale, inhale, surge, back, up. Exhale, inhale, surge, back, stay in the center. Find the balance of your head over your neck. Refine the intimate connection between what's inside of you and directly outside of you. That never changed even though your mind got caught up in the movement. Good, and then back. Open, forward, ground, open, back. Stay with the ground, launch forward, 
through, continuous, open, back, ground, launch, back to center, inhale up, exhale, open fluidly, lift, surge, fill the limbs from the spine to the limbs, come back, center, find the drop, lift, exhale, inhale, surge, fill the vessel, back, forward, open, center, bring your hands together, hands on your thighs, whatever you want to do, feel the movement, Good, and then I want you to elongate your back again. Oh my goodness, I must have blabbed too much. Come forward, I can't believe we're almost done here. All right, <clears throat> elongate here. So, has anyone ever been around the Redwoods? They're kind of freaky, they're wonderful. They literally transform the empty space around them, right? They literally, you can feel it in your subtle body. Right, it's, it's, it's a very bizarre sensation, right? And so I'm forward, I'm elongated here. Could I, how would I, what relationship would I have to the space around me where I could experience the world that a redwood is revealing? So whatever that means right now, Remember, there's going to be empty spaces even in the trunk of a tree. It's the empty space that does the space bending. Now I'm trying to be strong through the trunk the way a redwood is beyond my imagination. I have a harder time realizing it's not leaning forward because I don't have the down and the up. I need the forward in order to show me the down. So now I'm going to go back to here. Cometh the compression, right? Which makes me feel anti redwoodness, right? Like I'm not reaching and spreading up as much. So I'm going to try to become more like a, it's not just a mountain. Let it be a redwood here for a second. Let there be communication, unseen communication from underneath, from below you. softening, I'm about to prepare for Shavasana. Good, and then prepare for Shavasana. So one of my favorite little things that was just a short little couple of sentences for people that are tree sitting, they're up 200 feet and they look over and they see some salamanders. And they're thinking that the salamander, there's no way that a salamander could probably go 200 feet up a redwood. And whether this is true or not, they posited the idea that no, probably that genetic line of salamanders grew with the growing tree so that they started down here however many years ago let's say 500 and they end up at 200 feet 
because they've been living the whole time with the tree. And so it's not that it's one generation climbed up the tree, 500 generations went along with the tree to the point they are still surviving above the ground. They didn't come from the ground. I just love that. Like the fact that they might have just found their home in a smaller amount of space. So as you come back to Shavasana and you prepare, Time slows down in Shavasana, hopefully because you can stop judging it. Feel the symmetry of your body. Soften the skin on your face. Lift together teeth slightly apart. Soften your jaw. Stay tall without effort. Receive. Feel your breath. Just observe it. Try not to change it. It's brought you everywhere. Start to bring yourself back. Slightly deeper inhalation, slightly longer exhalation. When you're ready, open your eyes. It's too bright, close them again. It is bright here, for sure. And then open them again. 